Mm, I wanted something a little jazzy. So, <laughs> you know, I wanted a spiky chair, I want to light people on fire, because you know, I sort of, in my mind, confused with, like, European witch hunts. So I, that's at that point, I decided to just abandon it. <laughs> Sorry, Salem. Which is, I feel kind of bad because when I went to Salem, the head of like the college, she was in charge of all, was taking me around like, finally someone will tell the real story of what happened. <laughs> so, <laughs> so they hate it. Well, yeah, I mean, even with the Halloween films, I mean, the first one I did was a little more like, where I was like, well, I guess people want it like this. Because we're actually, not to diverge on Halloween too long, but when the Halloween films came to me, they go, we don't care. Just use the title Halloween, do whatever you want. We don't care about Michael Myers or any of that crap. I was the one who kept that in the story. They didn't care. They just didn't care what it was. I was like, no, it has to be Michael Myers. I'm doing this, yada, yada. But um, for the second one, I, I kind of went a little wacky on that one. And so I was, by that point, I was kind of back to just doing whatever I wanted. And with this, I was like, fuck it. I was go <laughs> nuts. Uh, well, I want to make sure we get some uh, some questions from you guys in. So, uh, who's, who's got some? Yes, over here. Hey, Oh, uh, yeah? Although I'm not sure those will be available at some point. <laughs> hey, now they will be because you want to buy one, so... Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, right here. Oh, yes. Yes, that's right. Hi. <laughs> I had a question. <laughs> For this role, or just for life in general? That's a big question. That's a personal question. Um, <laughs> my biggest inspiration. Um, I don't think there was one singular aspect or inspiration. I mean, Heidi is so multifaceted. Rob wrote a great character. Um, I, I think we just. I think I really wanted to start with her being a DJ first and foremost. I was really excited about that. And and what a cool kind of like hipster chick she was. Not she's not necessarily a rock chick per se, even though her favorite band is Rush. But I mean there were a lot, a lot of things that, that went into it. But I, I don't think it was like a big singular inspiration. I mean, the reality of it is, I go off, write some crazy stuff down, hand it to her, and she goes, really? I can do this? <laughs> so that's where the inspiration comes from. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I, I love the production design in Heisen's department. Like, it's, I love the touches, I love the, the film nods that are hidden there. Um, how much of that is you, Rob, thinking about what Heidi's backstory was and what those mean to her, and how much is just, I love the space, I want to use it. Well, the space was horrible one right there. I mean, we went, because we didn't have any money, so we just went to these horrible spaces. That was just some shit fake set that you've probably seen in a million porno movies or something. <laughs> that is the funny thing. Every time we location scout, and I'm not joking, literally on every single film I've done, they're shooting a porno movie on the sets we will later use. <laughs> I don't know if that says all the quality of the sets we're using for <laughs> budgets, but every time. Anyway, no, but I mean, I, I, <laughs> the production design is super important to me. I, don't, I mean, I nitpick every little thing, and it drives me crazy, because as soon as, even on day one, because we were so far behind that most of the time, especially in the hallway when she comes down with the dog for the first time, the walls are still wet. Because we had no, they wouldn't, they, we didn't have money, and enough money for prep time, so like, the, anything was, the paint was still wet, the things were, sometimes people were just holding walls up, because nothing was ever finished, because we never had to, they wouldn't let us prep anything. So I would just come in and quickly destroy it all and put it all back together again. Like, no, the bed has to go here. That's not going to go there. I hate this. And so they were always ready to, you know, come in and put the apartment back together because, you know, I get nuts about everything. I guess right up in the middle here. Yes. Okay. Rob, up until now, all of your villain sort of antagonists have been really attractive as opposed to other horror movies. So I came into this thinking, okay, the villain 
ones are going to be attractive, and then it ends up not being very attractive. <laughs> 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 it's a conscious effort to make being the antagonist not as attractive as I'm just trying to think what attractive villains are. Which ones are those that you're speaking of? <laughs> a little, as we say, rapist devil baby. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it looks like, I don't know, like a oven stuff a roaster popped open. <laughs> a lot of people go, that thing's not scary. Does it look like it's supposed to be scary? <laughs> Ridiculous. <laughs> Is it right, right here, sir. I guess, I love Weird Al. That was, that was, the Weird Al thing was the funniest thing, I was standing, I remember we were, we, we, I was shooting some scene in the police station with Brad Dourif, and I was going to just have Chris Harvard play a, a radio host, the interview, the interview is Malcolm McDowell, and I was like, no, let's make it a TV show, and I, and I was like, and I called Chris Harvard, I was like, what celebrity do you know that we can get on a plane in the next 24 hours, can Bob Saget do it? <laughs> I, I needed somebody that I wanted that would take all the credibility away from Dr. Lewis, <laughs> like when he's pouring himself out, he goes, I think Weird Al will do it. And, and like ten, like within six hours, Weird Al was on a plane flying in, not even knowing what he was doing. <laughs> and literally, Weird Al's only request was, "Can I wear my own shirt?" <laughs> it, it was. We filmed so much with Weird Al, it was so funny, but we didn't get to use. Well, um, and asking uh, about footage that's uh, been shot. This has been recut since your first screening tour. Yeah. And I, uh, even speaking with some of the actors, it sounds like there was some refiguring along the way and things that you adjusted. Um, is there much of this that, that you shot that you didn't use? Is there anything that you might want to toy with in the future with a, a home video cut or anything? Well, like there's tons of that. Even on a tiny schedule, I always overdo it with characters and stuff. So there's tons of stuff. I mean, if you watch the credits, it's like, there's more people cut out of the movie than are in the movie. Kier got cut out, Clint Howard, Dan Roebuck, again. Um, I don't know why Dan even bothers showing up. I always get him on the uh, <laughs> He knows it's good. That's why, actually, when I did these, I, I don't know if they're on to you, I did these bug commercials, and I felt so bad for cutting Clint and Dan out of the commercials. I cast them into bug commercials just to make it up to them. Um, but I, there was one thing. That was, Ernest Thomas, who played Raj on What's Happening, was the station manager at the radio station. We did all this he stuff. He's such a great performer. And he was so great. But our editing schedule was so short that the scenes didn't work. We could have made them work if we had more time. But rather than leaving them in and just having it be awkward, I took them out completely, which was a bummer. Actually, I think you can see them in the background. one shot, but um, That would be the only thing I might go back and add in. Cause, you know, it, they were really, it was really great stuff to get cut out. Some of the other stuff, I have this weird subplot of this Frankenstein versus Witchfinder movie within the movie that they're giving away free tickets to at the radio station. That's what Udo Kier and Dan Robert were all part of. That was nonsense. That's just me being insane. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, yes, right here in front. Hi, Sarah. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask I just think everyone should be me, I guess. <laughs> is that weird? No, and the real the reason for that is... No, it, well, even Jeff Phillips, who played White, that's what she means, yeah. beard, but Heidi had the dreadlocks like you have. Yeah. <laughs> but the real reason, is, the reason this is funny, too, is um, I get sick of watching clean-cut, fresh faces in movies. It drives me crazy because they just aggravate me. So I always want to scruff everybody up. But the big thing was... Since Jeff Phillips had just been in the movie before as like, you know, when he played Uncle Seymour Coffins in Halloween and stuff, I wanted to disguise him. So I said, grow a beard. But as we delayed the production, he just kept growing his beard. So it was like going to be just a beard, and then suddenly it's like, you know, Billy Gibbons in the movie. <laughs> but I thought it was funny, so I just left. It was just so out of control his beard. <laughs> and thankfully, he looked like me, too. Uh, That's it. Yes. This back here. Or together? <laughs> we'll just answer 
individually, because if, if we have to sit here and think of something together, it'll be a long day. Uh, silence. I was time. really excited the other day when um, Entertainment Weekly has this picture of of when they were doing a thing like witches are the new vampires, and it was Angelina Jolie as a witch and Julianne Moore, or Angelina Jolie as like Mel. Yeah, Melissa, Melissa, Melissa. <laughs> and, um, and Julianne Moore, and uh, Mila Kunis, and then Heidi. <laughs> on the room, we were all in the room, and I was like, wow, that's so Evan Cole on that picture. <laughs> <laughs> right, so that was my weekly highlight. <laughs> Well, I, you know, my highlight was um, at one point, I don't know, the highlight, but I just got to say something, um, was getting a thumbs up on TV from Roger Ebert for Devil's Rejects, because I would always watch System Ebert. You know? uh, so that was kind of cool, because I, you know, there's very few film critics you can really respect that really know what they're talking about. And, and I grew up with Cisco Ebert, and when Gene Cisco died, it was like, all the was was Ebert, and I thought, you know, you know. He sort of begrudgingly, it seemed like he didn't want to admit he liked it, but he did, and I thought that was kind of cool. So, Let me give it two sucker thumbs up. How to make it a joke. <laughs> well, he's, he's a tough hard critic. He is not a huge fan of the author, so that's, that's even more. Yeah, no, it was cool, he, you know. And uh, he did write Beyond the Valley of the Doll, so he will always be cool. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. Sure, right here. Well, cutting a record is easy. You know, it's just like me and like three other people, sometimes one other person. And we can waste all the time we want. It doesn't matter. But on a movie, it's like if you pop, like, you know, the, the clock seems to speed up, and as it goes around, money just flies off of it. You walk on set, you're already behind schedule. And if you pause for one second to think, like literally on this movie, we, most of the stuff we did in one, one take, because we didn't have time for two or three takes, because that would be great. Well, I love that. When take well, I know, because you want to wrap it up quick. But <laughs> <laughs> no, I had a lot to get through, so when take Yeah, I know, but so it. movies are hard because it's just so much money, even, even on a low-budget movie. I mean, this is a very cheap movie, and it's still ten times the budget for most albums, so yeah, no, it's more intense making a movie. Oh, I have to ask, the, uh, obviously with your first film, you went through a uh, real struggle with Universal getting it out, um, and now at Universal, probably more nights every year, there's that House of a Thousand Corpses Maze, and they've embraced the movie wholeheartedly because now there's an audience for it. Is that gratifying to see that after time passes, they've had to say, oh, okay, we love, our, we love this movie, and yes, it is part of our Halloween traditions. It's pretty funny, yeah, because like, what was it, last year, two years ago, we were there with the king, and we pretty much reunited the cast, because everyone hadn't been together since we shot the movie, and to just be there and see those giant billboards all over the park for House of a Thousand Corpses, it was pretty funny. But, but that wasn't the best revenge. Well, uh, that was a better revenge one, but I won't get into it. So it made me sound good. <laughs> but no, that was great. Yes, that was great. All right, I think we have time for a couple more right here. Sure. Hello. Hey, Ralph. Big Ben. Before I get to my question, I want to thank you. Just about two years ago, you helped pick my film up all the hornets, and that really meant a lot to me. It was really cool that you did that. All right, I'm cool. So that inspired me to make my second film. So my question was, what would you like to see? I mean, all I ever want, personally, I mean, whatever, whatever I want to see, I just want to see something I haven't seen before. That's what I like about movies, you know. It used to be that every time you went to the movies, you go, fuck me, I didn't see that coming. And now you go and you can sit there, you know exactly what's going to happen. You can sit, sometimes it, the amount of times I've sat in a movie and I, I know the dialogue before the characters say it, I'm like, why would I know the dialogue? So, yeah. so, just do something no one's seen before, or do it in your own way, at least, or something. Yeah, that's all anyone could ask for, I suppose. Yes, down here. Are you going to write something? No, but I might read a few more. <laughs> um, I okay. Yes. Sure. Yeah, well, I mean, you always have to deliver an R. I mean, you don't have to, but no one would be sitting here right now if we didn't, because we wouldn't be playing anywhere. Um, so yeah, you know, you always go to the MPA and they request some weird thing. 
It was mostly stuff with priests doing bad things that they objected to. Go figure. They said it wasn't accurate that the priest was trying to molest a young girl. I think that young girl was fine. I think on that note, folks, thank you very much for staying. Thank you.